Thank you so much to the Library of Congress for having us, and thank you to Politics and Prose, uh, which, with which we are very proud, Liberties is very proud to have a professional friendship. Uh, we are very grateful for everything they do to nourish this city. I'm Celeste Marcus. I am the managing editor of Liberties, which is a quarterly publication dedicated to culture and politics. I am here today with Morten Hoy Jensen, who is a professor of writer, writing at the New School and the author of A Difficult Death, which is a literary biography of Jens Peter Jakobsen. His essay for us, uh, rather masochistically, was a takedown of the literary biography, uh, which I hope we will get to talk about later. Uh, Sean McCreesh is a writer for New York Magazine, and he wrote for us a memoiristic piece called The Hatboro Blues, which was about growing up inside a city ravaged by the opi opioid crisis. Becca Rothfeld is literary critic and a contrib contributing editor at The Point, and she is just in the process of finishing up her first book, uh, which is a collection of essays that you will be able to buy in about a year. Okay. Liberties was started about two years ago and is dedicated to a very particular conception of the essay. Our essays are long. Uh, they're not pegged to anything, so they're not like occasioned by an event or the release of a book or a movie. We don't really do reviews, um, but we concede that not all essays are like this. So this first question is really for Becca and Morton, since you are both essayists. Sean, I will. I am coming for you. Um, <laughs> but if you guys could just talk a little bit about your relationship with the form of the essay, um, I would be grateful to you. I don't feel that I have a relationship with the form of the essay. Oh, great. So that's a bad answer. I feel like I have a relationship to each individual essay that I'm writing. Um, so I guess I tend to think that writing by genre is not the way to approach something. The way to approach it is to look at the subject matter and think about the sort of formal treatment that it demands. So that's not a satisfying answer because I don't have general thoughts about the essay, but that is how so I it's think a case about by it. case. Yeah, case by case basis, and sometimes a review is a better occasion for something that I would still qualify as an essay, but one that it's that treats like a particular theme through the lens of a book, okay. particular book. Fine. Sorry. I think I think for me that um, the the kind of essay that Liberties publishes, uh, which tends to be longer, as you said, and more expansive than the average kind of just straight book review. Um, is my preferred form because for me, um, essay writing especially is always an act of discovery. Um, so I, I rarely know what I think about a subject before I sit down and write about it. Um, all that sort of comes out in the writing itself. So having that, all that space to explore that and, and uncover that is important. Can I ask you a question about the essay that you wrote for us? Which yeah. Is of course the one I care about the most. Um, so it was a takedown of literary biographies, but you also wrote literary biographies. So did you know when you first started writing that um, that there was going to be some tension between your identity as the author of that essay and your identity as the author of the book that you wrote? It's funny because I envisioned that piece as a defense of literary biography. No. Um, as, as a kind of a yeah, slightly doomed genre, um, it, was, it was more a, a a, um, a takedown of a certain kind of biography, but, but a, a defense of, of, of writing biographies. And I think, like a lot of criticism, um, it is very self-serving in the sense that the kind of biography I was advocating for is what I myself kind of aspire to write. OK. All right, Sean. You don't write essays, although you did write one for us. Uh, what you do is typically called like long-form journalism, and I guess one essential or the essential difference between journalistic writing and essayistic writing is that uh, essays treat ideas and journalism is relaying information. Your work certainly does do that. You are like communicating information, but you do it with immense style. Um, you took New York City by storm when you moved there one year ago, uh, in part because your writing confers glamour. I would rather live in the description of a Sean McCreesh party than in the party itself. So was that consciously conceived? Were you trying to perhaps resuscitate a certain kind of style writing? Or what's, what's your relationship with this thing that you're doing? <clears throat> uh, well, thank you. That's very sweet. I, yeah, before I started my job at New York Magazine, I sort of inhaled a lot of journalism of the old New York Observer and the old Vanity Fairs and that sort of glamorous period when magazines were as thick as a doorstop. And, uh, there's not that much writing like that out there anymore, but that's really what made 
me want to move to New York and, and do all that sort of stuff. So I think it's bled into my copy. And um, you know, I think my job for what I do is to sort of understand who the readers are of New York Magazine. And it's a sophisticated person who knows the city like the back of their hand and kind of knows who the power players are. And they want to know what they're up to and who's up and who's down and where they fit into the power matrix. and. You know, you got to give them the inside dope. So you kind of have to get into the room and tell them what's happening there and who's interacting with who. And, and I think parties can be a really funny venue to, you know, see those creatures in the wild and go up to them and ask really sort of annoying questions and um, bring the reader along with you. Did you discover that on the job when you first started at New York Magazine? Was it like sort of a surprise for you that you could get at this underbelly through <coughs> these parties? Uh, well, no, actually, because I lived here in Washington all during the Trump years and worked at the New York Times, and my first couple pieces in the paper were for the style section, and they were all party reports. Oh. And it sounds sort of frivolous, but I learned then that going out at night and writing about the way people in Trump's Washington were interacting was actually a really good way of showing how the sort of, you know, the organism of, of Washington was kind of rejecting the president and the people around him, and you can see who who was at the party, who didn't get invited. You know, if you know Jim Comey's book party, who went to it that week, it, it sort of mattered, and um, that in and of itself, everything that happens here is a political statement, and, and that's true of the social life too. So it was a fun way to write about politics. Okay, cool. Um, you said that you were interested, you were excited by a kind of magazine-style writing that is like a throwback. Um, were there specific writers that you were trying to emulate? And then this is this question is for all three of you. Were there are there writers that you were like hope to channel? Um, and is there anybody you would rather die than imitate? <laughs> well, my uh, in terms of yeah, I mean my mentor is Maureen Dowd. I was her assistant for five years, and so everything I learned I learned from her. And uh, you know she's a singular voice, but she had a huge influence on me. But um, you know, also like the old Vanity Fairs and people like uh, Vanessa Gregoriadis is a magazine writer who you know that made me her her pieces were so good and sharp and funny that made me really want to do that for a living and um, yeah I mean all the greats obviously Tom Wolfe and Christopher Hitchens and Jim Wolcott and um, you know you flip through those magazines and it's just like such good writing on every page. Is that how you learn to write by reading them? I guess. You can't learn to write. No, it's true. <laughs> you're born knowing, or you're not. Just kidding. Go for it, girl. You answer the question. Um, I mean, there's tons of people. Well, as I was saying to Celeste before this, I don't think you should try to imitate anyone. I think that's a mistake. I think you should try to develop your own voice insofar as that's possible. But you should try to learn things from people, and um, people I return to, and I, in fact, read them before I sit down to write because they're good stylists, include Bernard Williams, the philosopher, Dwight MacDonald, who is like the sassiest, funniest writer ever, Elizabeth Hardwick, Lionel Trilling, William Gass, tons of novelists who are beautiful prose stylists. And there are lots of people I would rather die than imitate. <laughs> uh, but my principle is I never say anything mean about anyone by name unless I have the chance to attack them in print and substantiate my attack with lots of quotes of their bad prose. So I will not name them. <laughs> Brutal. <clears throat> I mean, I think similar to the, the Sean, what he says about uh, admiring um, an older kind of uh, journalism, I think Beck and I both admire or romanticize the kind of New York intellectuals, like the, that heyday of, um, I mean, which I think Liberties as a journal that kind of carries that torch on, um, you know, fairly small readerships, but the kind of uh, general, uh, generalist uh, essays, non-specialist, uh, what Irving Howe called the dilettante connoisseur. Um, and I mean, again, Dwight MacDonald for me is a lodestar. He and his wife literally published his journal, uh, Politics, from their tiny apartment uh, in New York during the Second World War. Um, and then another one for me is, is James Wood. Um, when I first moved here as an undergraduate, um, and I first started reading his essays, um, you know, it, it was a, a true revelation. Uh, I did not know that you could write that way about, uh, about books, that a, re a book review could be uh, an, an, a work of art in itself. James Wood is a great one. His, some of his best essays were for Leon Weasel Tears, New Republic. Exactly. Uh, Christian Lorenzen is another writer who is alive. I realize that none of the writers on my list are alive, so he's a living one that I read and like and try to emulate. We're in favor of both. Um, 
Okay, so you mentioned readership. You mentioned that you are writing for a particular kind of reader. Um, so what are you trying to do for your readers when you're writing? Are you trying to excite them? Are you trying to persuade them? Do you want them to feel pleasure or pressure? Uh, and do you want to change their minds? What is the service you're trying to provide? When I saw this question, the first thing that occurred to me is how weird it is, how little I think about this. Like, when I sit down to write, it's like getting up to dance. I don't actually devote a lot of thought uh, and attention to imagining my readership. Maybe because if I did, I would be too terrified to never write another word or something. Um, but in part because I guess I don't feel that it's my place to prescribe how my readership responds. You uh, said last night that if the reader, it's possible that the reader you're writing for doesn't exist, and if that's true, you should just write as if they did. Um, you said that as if that was something that you had thought to yourself before. Is that something that you have thought to yourself before? Oh, yes, yes. If an educated reading public does not exist, we must invent one. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I mean, I do think an educated reading public exists, and I've heard from them and had conversations with them, and my friends are among them. But um, I mean, I think that you can't know who's going to read your work. You can't know whether it's going to be interpreted charitably. I mean, I've written things that were interpreted very uncharitably. And so I think the best thing that you can do is imagine that you're writing for the smartest person that you know, a person who's smarter than you are, uh, to avoid condescending to your readership, which I think is the absolute worst thing that you can do. And so if you make the mistake of imagining specific people reading it, you might make the mistake of condescending if the particular specific people. <laughs> That's why you should only ever imagine Lionel Trilling reading your writing. There, there, was, <clears throat> there was a great TV interview with Philip Roth many years ago where he's asked, um, what do you want to do for us, the reader? And I, I, I want to say, like Philip Roth, but rather snootily, I can't worry about the reader, um, the, the, the two readers I have. Um, <laughs> but but um, I mean, I, I think Becca's right. You know, the Virginia Woolf's idea of the common reader, um, you know, intelligent, educated, but, but you want to be able to reach, reach, you know, in theory, anyone who is interested in ideas and books. Um, but I also think that when you're writing, I always try to write something that I would want to read myself. You know, you're, you're, you're writing because you want to fill a gap or a void of some kind. I think that's especially true with books, um, but I think it's also true of essays. Um, you know, you want to be saying something that you feel hasn't been said. And you said that you kind of discover what you think of an idea or a subject through writing about it. Yeah, so in some ways I am, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm also writing for myself because it's the only way that I have of, of really processing what I read. Um, and finding out what I think about something. Because I'm very bad at articulating that to myself. Oh yeah, I actually sort of disagree with them when they're saying you can't think about the reader. I do the opposite, where I don't think about what the subject is gonna think of it. It's almost not your business what they think, and it's this really weird thing where you spend all this time with people. I'm right now, I'm working on this big profile of a very powerful CEO, and you know, I've spent a lot of time with this person, I've called everybody in their life, and you go through something with the subject, and it's really weird, but you can't think about how they're gonna react to the piece, because how they feel about it, first of all, it's impossible to predict, um, and it's sort of irrelevant, because the only one that matters in that relationship is the reader, because that's why you're spending all the time with the person, that's why you're doing all the reporting, like, you're, my loyalty is to the reader of the magazine, so I have to tell them, what the actual deal is here. I can't sugarcoat it, or I can't ignore certain things that are inconvenient because the reader has the right to know it. So I just think about the person who's paying the money to, to read the magazine and subscribe to it. And I, I don't think about what the subject's gonna think. I think about what the reader's gonna think. Have you ever gone into an assignment thinking that it would go one way, like perhaps you would be sympathetic to the subject or, or, or not, and then been like completely surprised by what the reality was and felt as if like you had to revise. Yeah, all the time. I mean, I think you go into it with a conception of the subject and that's why you pitch the piece and you think that they're either a villain or some great awesome person. Um, and you have to constantly remind yourself to be open to surprises because that's the whole point of reporting. You wanna learn as much as you can and you have to be open to going down a different direction. That's true of normal essays too, I think. I think you should go in not knowing what you think when you sit down to write. I mean, I also think only in writing. I only figure out what I think when I write. So I don't know if I think any of the things that I'm saying right now, I'd have to write to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that you should, you should surprise yourself. You should allow the arguments to take you to a surprising conclusion if that's where they take you. And it's no fun to read an essay 
conclusion of which is obvious at the outset. It's only fun to read an essay when there's sort of a narrative drama in addition to an argumentative drama because yeah. you're uncertain of what the essay will conclude. And you can tell when a writer sits down and writes something and they think that they know everything about it and have not been surprised by the essay. There's like a kind of kinetic energy that's missing from that kind of work. Um, yeah. Obviously, nothing in Liberties has ever been like that. Um, okay, so you've been surprised by the directions that your essay have taken, but have you ever been surprised, and it could be disappointed or it could be, it could be a good surprise, by how people have interpreted something that you've written? Um, Becca, you want to take this one? Yes, I'm always surprised at people's ability to extract from your essay the absolute opposite of what the words on the page say. <laughs> That's happened to me, um, which is one of the reasons that I try to keep uh, sort of the ideal reader foremost in my mind. I mean, I don't know, I think of my husband, an ideal reader, a smart and charitable man with whom I can speak about the things that I'm writing. Uh, he's the person I imagine. But yeah, I've had experiences where that has happened and it feels, uh, it feels sort of uniquely horrible, but then also that's just a liability of writing. Everyone who's ever written has been misunderstood. It's true. I have not had the uh, pleasure of being dragged on Twitter yet, so oh. um, you know, Stick I'll, I'll answer that question in the future. It's bracing. Um, I, did, I did write a short piece uh, for Adam Kirsch of the Wall Street Journal a few years ago about how much I love flying and how much I love airports, all the things that normal people hate about traveling. <laughs> Um, and for weeks afterwards, I kept getting emails from people telling me that they grew up next to this and that airport, their father was a pilot, and I ended up being invited on some obscure travel show to talk about this essay. So that was my, wow. my only sort of viral experience, if you can call it that. I wrote an essay about how much I hate talking and how I think writers should not be invited to talk, and I got all these invitations to talk. <laughs> I thought that was a joke. I thought it was a joke. I'm, I mean, I'm kidding. I like talking only to Celeste, though, so I'll only do panels with her. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, I've been ripped apart on Twitter before. Um, <laughs> it's, it's actually that wasn't kind of... the question, guys. <laughs> I think it's kind of, kind of exhilarating, actually. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, it's like being tickled. <laughs> We should, we should paraphrase Kingsley Amos and say that a bad tweet sh or a mean tweet should ruin breakfast but not lunch. That's good. Yeah, that but you good. have had really lovely experiences with readers who have like surprised you by how much they loved your writing. And I'm talking about one experience in particular that I, it's a story I think you should tell. You got all of these incredible books from this reader who had like decided to send you all these. Yeah, tell the story, please. Sure, yeah. So. Um, uh, I, I'm working on a, a book about Thomas Mann, and I've written a couple of pieces on Thomas Mann. And um, uh, a, a gentleman reached out to me, um, very generously offering me um, his family's uh, first editions of, of Thomas Mann's novels in German uh, that had traveled with his grandfather from uh, Frankfurt to Zurich um, in the 30s, and then uh, to America um, in, in exile during the Second World War. Um, and the day after I had uh, you know, accepted this very this, uh, gracious offer, they arrived uh, to my apartment. And one of the books, he didn't even mention this in his email, was signed by Thomas Mann. Cool. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's a really unique and, and wonderful experience. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, all right, and this is related to my next question. So we now, all writers, unfortunately, can have numerical data about like how our piece is doing. Um, we can tell how many people have read it, and this is not just like whether or not we're being dragged, but just like you get a certain kind of reinforcement when you write the kind of piece that whoever the creatures are who are on social media, they're the ones that want to read this thing. Um, they're not all the readers, but they are the ones that we can like have the most accessible data about. Um, so it's really tempting to qualify success based on how well a piece is doing on social media. Um, do you do that? And are there other ways that you qualify success that are more lasting and important to you? And I hope so. And what are they? You can't actually tell, I think, how many people are reading your piece. This was an important sort of experience that I had when I wrote my piece for Liberty's Sanctimony Literature, uh, which I thought was going to be print only because the journal at the time when I wrote the piece was print only. So I was like, great, I'm going to really let loose. I'm going to really attack <laughs> these authors I hate. Like, really, no one's going to know. It won't go viral. It was the first piece that they posted on the website. It went viral. People on Twitter were really mad about it. So if you just looked at Twitter, you would have thought for like a few days anyway that everyone who read it hated it. But in fact, I got 
got tons of email from people who liked it. Tons of pieces were commissioned on the basis of, the, of that piece. It was good for my career, so I think Twitter is actually often quite misleading. Yeah. Uh, it's not an answer to the broader part of the question, but it is an answer. Yeah. Important. I, I don't... Um... I mean, you shouldn't think about it, but of course we do, and there is that because you know we're we're very narcissistic and and we're uh, thin-skinned, um, and we obviously want to be read, um, but you know you, you sh I don't think you should care about whether things get retweeted and so on. Or, um, but you know what what matters is um, a comment from a a writer that you admire or a peer that you respect and admire, um, and if you know if someone comes up to you and says, "Oh, you wrote that piece." Um, that is much more gratifying, I think, than anything numerical. Yeah. I think you know when you've written a good piece. I mean, that's a boring answer, but I sort of, you know, sometimes I'm like, this one really worked, good. That's success to me. Well, when you work on staff at a newspaper or magazine, you have access to all these wretched tools that give you the exact analytics of the piece, so you know how many clicks it's got. and. Most depressingly, there's like always a stat that tells you the average reader time. So it's like they stay on the piece oh. for two minutes, and you're like, but it takes eight minutes to read this piece. You know, it's really, really depressing. <laughs> it takes three months to read this piece. Yeah, so I don't really look at that stuff because it really can screw you up. But, um, you know, it's nice when a piece hits big on Twitter or you kind of feel like you're being struck by lightning. But um, you have to remember that only crazy people tweet, and the ones that you really want to reach probably aren't tweeting every little thought that enters their head, but they're still reading your stuff, hopefully. You, your piece for us was like a very unusual kind of thing for you to write. Um, what was the response to that that you got? To, specifically, I'm thinking about people from your hometown, but any, I'm interested in any. Yeah, it was really gratifying. It was a first person piece about a lot of, um, you know, dark stuff that happened in a town that was ravaged by the opioid crisis and friends I'd lost along the way. And, you know, I, I don't really write first person, so um, the feedback was really nice. Probably the last time I'll ever do something like that. So. <laughs> it was our first. It was our, our first issue. It was really. It was an important and uh, special thing for us. Yeah. Um, all right. We kind of. We kind of already covered this, but I'm going to ask you the question straight out anyway. How afraid are you of being hated on social media, and how much does it affect what you decide to write about? I mean, I'm terrified. Uh, there's a little chorus of angry tweeters in my head constantly every time I write a sentence. It was really bad during the pandemic because my entire social life during the pandemic, basically besides the person I lived with, was the internet, and so I kind of became like totally paranoid. Uh, but I think I was basically cured by the sanctimony literature debacle because I saw that even if people are mean about your piece on Twitter in a sort of limited way, nothing actually happens uh, to you. You know, as long as you're able to keep writing, what can they really do to you? is what I came out of it thinking, and that thought has fortified me. So now I care less about Twitter. I mean, well, I guess we'll find out if there are legions of extraordinarily angry and temperamental Thomas Mann fans on Twitter. <laughs> but um, I somehow doubt it. Um, so, you know, but, you know, of, of course it affects you. Um, and of course, it, I, I don't think that, you know, nobody would in their, honestly would say that they don't care, but, um, I also think that when you're writing, you, you, you know, you kind of, all that kind of falls away into the background. Um, you know, I put my phone away, I know you do too. My computer um, has no internet. Your computer has Remove no internet. Remove the Wi-Fi card from the computer. That's insane. And yes. you know, I think, yeah, there's a, there's a shallow and superficial way in which you think about it, but once you do the writing itself, it, it you know, that takes over. Um, and when you're in that space, uh, there's not much room for, for, for the, you know, that comes after when you publish the piece or whatever. Yeah, you have to constantly remind yourself not to think about it, because if you do, why write at all? The exactly. point of writing is to tell the truth or to yeah. say things that you think are true and interesting, and it, when you prevent that from happening, there's no point, because you're not making lots of money if you're writing essays. <laughs> and if, so if you can't tell the truth, why are you doing it? And then if you, and if you start you know, tailoring your writing to, to your audience's expectations or to some imagined uh, expectations, then then you, I mean, then I think you're doing yourself an enormous disservice. Oh yeah, agreed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're not writing for your readership. You're not writing for social media. Um, how do you decide what to write about? How do you decide what to pitch? What you think that you can endure spending tons of time with. 
Like, I mean, I write mostly literary criticism, so mostly I'm writing about books, and if I'm writing about an author, I'm gonna try to read everything the author has written, and probably lots of things that have been written about the author, so I just choose it on the basis of passion. I get to write about Colette this year, I get to write about Kafka this year, and I'm so excited to spend time with those authors. They're authors that I love. It's well worth reading everything they've written. My dog's named Kafka also, unrelatedly. <laughs> you do periodically write essays about books that you don't like. I think that there's such a thing as a hate crush. I'm developing uh, this idea. Uh, but I mean, you can want to spend time with something because you hate it so much. This is how I feel about the philosopher Alistair McIntyre. <laughs> McIntyre, if you're watching, I'm coming for you. Um, you know, you just, you hate it, and so you really want to get, you want to figure out why it irritates you so much, what's so wrong with it. I mean, I think that it's passion that makes you want to write about anything. I mean, of course, there's the boring answer, which is someone commissions a piece on it, and that's some of the things that you have to write about. But anything that you're driven to write about is because you want to spend time with it for one reason or another, in my opinion. That's why I write about things. Yeah, I was going to say my story ideas fall into two categories, which is like stuff that pisses me off, and you get really fired up and you call your editor and you're like, you, you believe this? Like, I, we should, you know, somebody should write about this. Or it's like the thing you want to tell your friends at the bar at the end of the week, you know, like you're, you're having a beer and you're like, yo, the craziest thing happened, this is so interesting, like, you know, it's just the thing that motivates you, basically. Gotta read Kafka, guys. Friends at the bar, read Kafka. <laughs> it's not what we're talking about at my bar, but. <laughs> She's a lot of fun at a party. I'll come, I'll tell people at your bar about Kafka. Okay. I, I prefer to be commissioned to do something, like for, for an editor to suggest a topic or, or a book, because if left to my own devices, I tend to pick 19th century Danish novelists that nobody has ever heard of, or Thomas Mann. We love that. Um, but, but uh, you know, I did a piece for Gawker earlier this year that uh, they sent me a, a, a really horrible book by um, the guy who wrote, who created Parks and Recreation. Uh, he wrote a work of moral philosophy, if you can believe it. Wow. Um, and, uh, and I, you know, never ever a book I would have thought to write about myself, but I really enjoyed um, writing about it. Not reading it, but I enjoyed writing about it. <laughs> um, but, I, you know, I like to be, I like editors to challenge me to, to try something else. Yeah, sometimes the editor can find an author that you love, too. Yeah, that exactly. You, you wouldn't exactly. have realized that you loved. Like, I discovered Iris Murdoch because I was assigned to write about her. I mean, I knew she existed, but I hadn't read her, and it was a perfect match of subject and writer, and I love her forever. Thank you. These two Andy are Marcus. scary. I do not want you to read my book <laughs> <laughs> whenever I write it. Your book is going to be great. We're going to love it. <laughs> All right, one more question, and then I think we'll open it up to Q&A. Um, what are books that you're looking forward to coming out. You can you can say books by non-contemporary writers, but you do also say books by contemporary writers. Like, what are you reading right now? Um, or what is about to come out that you're looking forward to? And this is a way of plugging writers that you admire. I'm reading Bernard Williams, who is dead. He's an amazing philosopher that everybody should read. Ethics and the Limits of Philosophy is an amazing book. I highly recommend. I also recommend the recent novel, Acts of Service, by Lillian Fishman, which is one of the best novels I've read in years. It's one of the smartest treatments of sex I've seen in years. I think it deals really well with a more philosophical discussion about sex that's been sort of ongoing. Uh, it's a good, like, fictional treatment of that. There's also a book coming out later this year by the critic Brian Dillon, who's an editor at the magazine mm. Cabinet. Mm. He's wonderful. Um, it's going to be fabulous. His other books are also fabulous. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm still in my Thomas Mann phase. So I'm mostly reading uh, German history um, and, and stuff related to Thomas Mann. But um, Daryl uh, Pinkney has a book coming out about his relationship with Elizabeth uh, Hardwick. Uh, I forget the title of it, but something about September. Uh, something, yeah, come see me in September or something. Uh, but it's I might be writing ab about it, um, and I, I'm very very excited to read that. Um, and then next year, um, New York Review Books Classics is publishing a, a Danish novel called The Liar uh, by Martin Hansen, uh, which is a great 20th century uh, Danish novel that I'm excited to to see in English. They're also publishing some new translations of Colette Sherry and The Last of Sherry. She's wonderful. New York Review Classics is. Great publisher. Do you know who the translator is? I don't, but I will soon because I'm writing about it. I don't remember it. Oh, you know, I just have to read so many newspapers and magazines for work. I don't really get to read these philosophy books. Like <laughs> do. Um, but I do read, I, usually when I read books, it's because I have to write about the person. And I just finished reading um, Jan Wenner's memoir, which comes out next week, which was really good and juicy and a fun read. And before that, I profiled. Um, the Democratic operative Liz Smith, and she's written a, a memoir of her political life, and it was really fun and funny. So that's what I recommend. 
Okay, and I'm reading Come to This Court and Cry, which is by an author named Linda Kinsler. It just came out like two weeks ago, and it is um, it's like a murder mystery about the Holocaust, but it's also a really brilliant philosophical meditation on our relationship with memory and justice. So you can buy that at Politics and Prose. You can buy all these books at Politics and Prose, and you As should, because it's a good institution. Not Amazon. Um, okay, I think that the way the Q&A is operating is that you go to either of the two microphones um, in the middle of the aisles. I just wanted to ask you to clarify something that you, you said it, but I missed it and it scrolled by before I could get it. You mentioned a book that was a novel and you talked about it being a really interesting philosophical exploration of sex, but I didn't catch the name of the author of the book. Acts of Service by Lillian Fishman. Okay, thank you so much. That's really good. Okay, my question has to do with the process. Um, what kind of things do you do before you start an essay? How do you actually come up with the ideas and how do you put the ideas together? Read from a long time. I read, I annotate everything that I read. I mean, I'm usually writing about an author or a work of literature, or sort of a literary idea, so I read everything that I think is related, often for several months. I annotate. When I'm done with that, I transcribe all my annotations and all my underlines, then I organize them into an outline, then I put the outline on a USB, put it onto my computer without internet, and then I write that thing. <laughs> God, I, like I, wish, I wish you hadn't just told me that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Are you guys not going to answer the question? <laughs> Not after Becca, no. no. That's a normal process. <laughs> you, your process is very different. Oh, I don't write essays, so I don't know. No, how do you write a piece? I mean, how do you just, you like, oh, you're going to put it Oh, you know, if you're going to write about somebody, yeah, you have, to, you have to, first you have to find everything, every single thing that's ever been written about them, and then I print it all out, and I circle things, and then you have to call everyone who knows them, and you have to find out what the pressure points are, and what the dirt is, and, you know, the, the tension, and you have to, you know, kind of figure out who they are, and then you get them in a room, and you ask them all the questions. That's exactly what I plan to do with Kafka. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that when I write something, usually what happens first is that I'll be sitting with an idea for a long time, usually, it's something that other people are writing about, but I feel like they're missing some essential part of it. Um, that's usually how I decide what I want to write about. It's like there's a subject that is being discussed wrongly. Um, and so I'm like frustrated with the way that it's being discussed or with some element of it that's being left out. And I sit with that um, like gnawing contempt for a while and make notes and read like everything around it and continue to be frustrated by the things that I'm reading and sometimes like read some things that are, like seem to answer the question entirely and then I feel like that's what I want to write about. Um, so like I found this book by Simone de Beauvoir which is like the subject of the essay that I just wrote for Liberties which I felt like treated a part of feminism or feminist anxiety that people weren't talking about anymore and then I just like wanted everyone to know about that so that's how I decided for that essay. Do you want to you want to go for it? Sure. Um, well, I mean, it's it's similar to Becca's, except messier and probably a little bit lazier. Um, you know, I, I tend to to start writing as I'm doing research and as I'm reading, um, and I I start putting things into a, a Word doc or a Google doc, and uh, gradually, hopefully, something emerges, some kind of narrative or or, or a, a glimmer of a structure, um, and then I start to okay, then I start to follow that thread and. Um, and then, you know, I mean, sometimes it goes wrong. Sometimes it, it doesn't really work and the ideas aren't coming together. Um, but, um, you know, most of the time they do. Yeah. Usually I begin with the question. I decide, like, what topic yeah. to choose because there's something that I don't understand. Or there's an author I love who has a book coming out or hate who has a book coming out. Those are the, <laughs> those are the three possibilities. Uh, so I was curious. Uh, like, you kind of already answered this a little bit, but like, when you're trying to organize your thoughts for an essay or a long form article, uh, do you guys have any software that you like to use that really helps you out that's not just like a, you know, Microsoft product, or do you mostly use analog products? The best yeah. software is a pen and notebook. Okay. Yeah. My, my favorite software is my friends. I make them talk to me about <laughs> it. <laughs> I just dump everything into a Google Doc. Yeah. 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 
I use Microsoft Word. I hate Google Docs for some reason. Oh, I don't know why. I'm just not yeah, used to it. Yeah, but if you it. lose your computer, it's all gone. I like the risk. That's true. I, I just dumped a glass of wine into my computer last week. And that does not shock me. <laughs> don't tell IT that. But, um, yeah. Yeah, so we live in an age where everybody has an opinion about everything, and a lot of those opinions are very bad. And I feel like that lends itself to a lot of really cheap hot takes out there. And so I wonder if you would sort of compare and contrast essay or long form journalism or the sort of work that you do with these really shitty hot takes out there. What's the difference and how can we as discerning readers sort through and find the thought and essay that are, re are really worth engaging with? I, mean, I think for, a, I mean, a journal like Liberties um, is great because it's sort of created to you know, avoid a kind of a hot take because the, the essays are very long. Um, so they take a long time to write. You know, they take a fairly long time to read. Um, but so much more thought and effort goes into them. Um, so that, you know, a, a journal like that um, is, I think, rare but, but deeply necessary because of, as you say, all these sort of bad opinions and hot takes. That's a really good question. I think the best way is just to sort of select by uh, publication. And so there's certain publications where like the process, you just know it's not, is anathema to quick thinking. So Liberties is one, the point, which I added, I'm biased, is another, I think. Um, the New York Review of Books, the London Review of Books, yep. Harper's. Yeah. New York Magazine. New York Magazine, <laughs> of course, top of the list. Um, I think that that's all that you said is true, especially the bit about New York Magazine. Um, I also think, Editors are really important. I understand that Substack is a great phenomenon and it works for a lot of people and you know, best of luck to all of them. But I do think that, obviously I'm partial because I am myself an editor, but I, I think that like between Twitter and Substack and all of these other um, platforms for getting your views out immediately, and I think that there's a lot of good in that. I mean, I think that the way that Sean, for example, uses Twitter is admirable and the right way to do it. I think there are other writers who use Twitter really admirably, but Typically, because there's just, you get a lot of positive feedback um, for the least amount of effort. And it's really, it, it can be really detrimental for a writer um, to decide, and really easy for them to decide, that they will advance far more professionally, not by writing essays or books, but by living on social media. And it's true that they can um, become a much bigger name that way. It, their writing will suffer for it. So having, editors you admire who are going to be tough on you and make you rethink things and make you rewrite things. It's just that is how you become a better writer. Um, and I think that that is, that is the secret that we've known all along. Yeah. yeah, I completely agree. Editors are everything, yeah. Yeah, if someone ever says that they don't like to be edited, that's a red flag. Yeah. Don't read their writing, or do, but. Don't date them. You know. <laughs> yeah, don't date them. <laughs> um. Just pick me up or do I have to bend down? It works. Um, if we really like the kind of writing that happens in Liberties and in similar journals, and as folks that have written essays at a number of publications, do you find that there are factors in common across the ones that have let you do really good writing? Um, is, it, is it primarily personnel-based? Is there something structural about the journals? And if we want to see the ecosystem sort of produce more of that kind of writing, are there lessons that can be applied more broadly from the outlets that are that are allowing writers to go out and do these kinds of of good essays. That's a great question. Courage is the most important factor in running a good magazine or publication. I think that that is like the secret ingredient, um, and I don't think that it can. It's not scalable. So you have to be, you have to have access to the kinds of editors and publishers who are willing to take risks and to invest in writers who are doing things that are unusual. Um, and I hope that there are more of these new publications. I'm conscious of like several that just sprout up all the time and their leadership is willing to take risks. I hope that the um, bigger names will see that that's paying off. I am not hopeful that that will happen. Um, and so I hope instead that people will just tell everyone they know about these small journals um, because they need bigger subscriber bases. Yeah. Uh, head to libertiesjournal.com. So, yeah. I also think that you have to believe that there is an audience for this kind of writing out there, um, which there is. And I, in some ways, you know, our, our the popular culture is sort of infantilizing and teaches us that this doesn't exist, but that's just not true. Um, you know, there is, a, there is an audience out there for intelligent, rigorous, um, beautiful writing. Um, so I think that's just, you know, you have to, to accept that. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think the editing process is different at the range of magazines that I think is really good. So I, that's a different sort of answer. Like I think at Liberties, the editing is often like it's a hands-off editing process. Like there's editing, it's but there's discussion about like the big ideas. But at the point with magazine that I edit, you know, recently like Celeste got something back with a ton of comments and she was like, "What is this? Do you hate it?" And I was just like, "No, no. This is just how the point like editing process is. Is like it's a completely different cacophonous. Like we're having arguments with each other in the comment section. Is like, no, Aristotle's wrong about that. Like shut up. No, Celeste should leave it in, or like whatever. And so I think you just have to find someone who's willing, as she says, to let you take risks. Uh, but who also is committed to treating their audience as intellectual equals and not dumbing stuff down. But that, that, that can take lots of forms. It can take the form of cacophonous yeah. editing or different forms of editing, too. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was really struck by what you guys said about how the, things, the topics that you choose to write about are things that really piss you off or you make, make you feel really passionate about something. As someone who just graduated college, I think there, myself and quite a few of my peers are interested in, in exploring and you know, putting out our ideas and something more than just a tweet, as you were mentioning, or just out in social media. So do you have any advice for you know, people like me who are interested in, in, in writing and interested in putting out our opinions and where I would start with something like that? Be careful. Don't put out your opinions everywhere right out of college, because nobody will hire you, and editors look at the Twitter feed and you know, you're young, so you don't have opinions yet. You know, it's like, you're supposed to just kind of reel it in a little bit, but p they, people think that as long as you have some kind of crazy hot take that's going viral, that's the way that you're gonna get, you just have to be really careful in the beginning because it all can come back to bite you. And I cringe when I think about some of the stuff that I posted yeah, when too. I was 23 or 24 or 25. I mean, it's like, you know, you gotta wait until you have find the thing that's worth publishing because not every, you know, everything pisses me off, but not everything's worth writing about. Yeah, I feel that way too. I think another thing is at the beginning, unfortunately, you have to be willing sometimes to write for free or for not enough money. I mean, the real answer to this question about how we can have more magazines like this is there should be more money for them, there should be more public arts funding, people should pour more resources into magazines like this, but they don't, it's the sad reality. And so I think, I mean, the first, couple of big pieces I wrote. One was I was compensated working for Leon Wieseltier, but so, uh, several of the others I was basically not compensated, but it was worth it because I got to write what I wanted at the length that, that I wanted. The editing was good and then people saw it and I had like clips that I was proud of. So I think one thing to do is try to write longer essays for venues that pay less yeah. and that's the way to get your name out there. I wish it weren't like that. We all have to the fight. The beginning's really hard, yeah. It is yeah. hard. Yeah, avoid the rush to publication, I think. You know, there are definitely things I wrote in my early to mid-20s that I wish I hadn't uh, written and that are online. You know, back in the day, they used to you know, be on some obscure journal gathering dust somewhere. But now, because of the internet, it's you know, readily searchable. Um, there's a, a line somewhere that a, a literary critic uh, is someone who conducts their education in public. Um, and that's a very painful truth in the age of the internet because everyone you know, can see how how little you know <laughs> a lot of the time. What I would say is um, find a writer who you really admire, yeah. read all their stuff, and when you have like accrued authority, write to them and ask them for help. Send them some, like first establish that you have really done the work here because I think all of us have done this. Yeah. Um, you have to, it, it's hard to do it. It's the most important thing for a young writer is to get edits. You need someone giving you feedback. Um, and the best way to do that, I think, is to find a writer you really, really admire and work hard to get. Not, you don't need them to tell you that you're good. In fact, like you need them to tell you why you're not good yet. Um, so it's a thick skin, but ask them for help. And if they're a nice person, and not all of them are, um, but some of them, someone will be, um, they'll help you out. Michael. All right, I have a question for all four panelists and it's about the essay form. And I just want to offer a generalization and get your opinion of it. I think that essays are almost all, by definition, autobiographical. And I have in mind even the ones that are not explicitly autobiographical. I'm just curious how you would evaluate that generalization. I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I actually, many uh, instances of the so-called personal essay are bad, but I've never understood the animosity against the personal essay in general, because I think that what you're doing as a critic or essayist is uh, interposing style between yourself and the world, and that's why people read you, and so in some way that's personal. 
Yeah, and, and similar to, to the, what, what I said before, that you're, you know, you're, you're showing everyone what you know and what you don't know. Uh, you're showing your thinking. Uh, I mean, it, it's actually a very intimate thing uh, to show that the way, yeah. Sorry. I have to wrap it up. I would only say that lived experience is an authority, but it's not the only or the most important kind of authority. Thank you all for coming, uh, and thank you to the three of you for this wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you.